think what's special about Quincy is the people. I mean, they're, they're proud people. General McCall's dad was a hockey ref in Quincy Youth, so I think he might have tackled me once or twice and, and threw me in the sin bin. So many of the kids uh, roughly of the same age in the neighborhood, and uh, it was just a great place to grow up. That Quincy High School teacher probably pushed me more in the direction and the path I ended up on than anyone else I, I met along the way, I bet. The Air Force was his passion. I know he would get a be very humble and get a big kick out of this. I said, you know, Ma, I think I'll apply down at the shipyard to be an apprentice. And she said, I, I've got something else planned for you. They were the greatest generation. There's, there's no, no question about it. The idea of ordinary people doing extraordinary things is something that has made Quincy a special place since the settlement at Mount Wollaston. Names like Hancock, Adams, Faxon shaped our city and are largely responsible for what Quincy is today. We have made it a point to preserve their legacies while moving forward in writing our own story. Moments in history shape our culture and community. Our freedom has allowed us to evolve and celebrate what's new while honoring those who came before us and whose character helps define us. It begs the question, who do we have to thank for our freedom? My father was a World War II veteran, my brother a Vietnam era veteran, and my son a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. That's an example of one Quincy family with a proud military history. Those of us in Quincy know that there are thousands of families with that same connection, that same duty to serve and preserve our way of life. My father founded the Quincy Flag Day Parade in 1952 to foster and instill patriotism in our young people. It's the longest running event of its kind on the East Coast, if not the whole country. It might just be Quincy's signature day. Residents old and new come together unified in patriotism and love of our country and our community. The highlight of the Flag Day has always been the thousands of flag-waving youngsters from sports and civic organizations taking part in a rite of passage, marching in the parade, taking pride in the flag themselves and our community. Many of those flag-waving Quincy youngsters have become some of the greatest leaders in our community, leaders of our commonwealth, and leaders of our nation, the greatest our generation has seen. The city of Quincy is doing justice to the memories and the lifetimes of seven of its sons whose efforts have led them to positions of enormous responsibility in times of great consequence for our nation. This ceremony is a star-spangled example of who the people of this city are and the type of place that the city of Quincy remains. The men we honor today are not only the pride of Quincy, Massachusetts, they are the pride of our nation. And they have served as guardians of the very ideals of freedom and justice and equality that have been at the vanguard of what it truly means to be an American. My brother grew up in an Irish working class family. Our dad was a career Boston police officer, a man of high integrity who was dedicated to serving others. And our mom, like many of the moms of the folks on this stage, was the backbone of our family. We were taught at a young age, through their example, of the importance of education, service to others, and hard work. My brother played team sports, baseball at Perkins and Adams Fields, early morning skating at the MDC rinks in the area, and basketball at the courts at the end of Narragansett Road. My brother continued to learn about the importance of service and being a part of something larger than himself. And we've heard a lot about that today. It was really this that attracted him to serve as a Marine. A sense of community was an important influence and there was no better place to come from than Quincy, Massachusetts. And for him specifically, the neighborhood of Marymount. 
I'm incredibly proud to be from Quincy, the city of presidents. We have a long and proud history of excellence in public service that of course dates back to John Adams and when he headed down to Philadelphia at the founding of our country. And I'm particularly proud of those from Quincy who have chosen to serve in uniform. And the list of Quincy natives that have answered that call to service is distinguished. It includes, as General McConville said, John Hancock, World War II Medal of Honor recipients, William Caddy and Everett Pope, courageous Vietnam War POWs, Richard Stratton and Alan Brudno, and so many more. So we had a bunch of kids running around Marymount, but uh, there was an awful lot for them to do. We had a good playground, good ball field, tennis courts, beach was at the end of the street. They were all good kids, they were good families. They just enjoyed each other, and as I say, to this day, many of them are still friends. Truly did grow up uh, in Marymount, and uh, I think my parents had, uh, had gone house hunting. They were looking, obviously, for a city that had good schools. They were looking for a city that had neighborhoods. We, uh, we grew up right up the street from a park. I think that was a big attraction. And then, uh, and then also uh, on the waterfront uh, in Quincy is always a, is always a big attraction. Baseball, street hockey, basketball are the tradition known only to our neighborhood as Hillies versus Swampies. It was during these competitions, along with the inevitable dust-ups that resulted, where we were all knocked down in some form or fashion. But more importantly, it was where we learned to pick ourselves up on our own. So when Jim left for West Point at 18 years old, 44 years ago, in the summer of 1977, our neighborhood and lessons learned went with him. Quincy is a part of his DNA. You know, as I travel around the world, and I get a chance to do that fairly often, I often get asked about the great people from Quincy that are serving in our military. They ask, what's in the water up there? What is it about Quincy that creates all these great leaders in military servicemen. And what I tell them, it's not what's in the water, it's what's in the people. Because people from Quincy are honorable, they're resilient, they're hardworking patriots who are willing to serve their country in a time of war, knowing they are putting themselves in harm's way so others may enjoy freedom and prosperity. I take the trip to West Point uh, when he was a, a youngster uh, to see those people at West Point. And uh, even being an Navy guy, they were in a class by themselves. Uh, we, we stopped at the Coast Guard Academy. But with all due respect to the general, he wasn't that much of a swimmer, so <laughs> he, he felt he'd be on the Army. You know? and that, the West Point was his, his target from day one. One of the co-workers at the Gearworks' son was a major at West Point. He showed us around West Point, and you know, at the time, you, the people talk about primal cues. I'd seen uh, that school, and I was very fortunate that uh, Senator Kennedy would nominate me many years later, and I'd have a chance to go to West Point. That set me on the path I'm on today. You know, I grew up uh, like many of the kids. We used to skate. There used to be a marsh uh, out behind uh, Broad Meadows, and we all skated there. And uh, came up to Quincy Youth, which was a wonderful program. They they built the rink. I was there before the rink was built. And hockey's a great sport uh, for life. Not the fact you can be a professional hockey player, but you get knocked down and you get back back up. And you know, those who are successful in life overcome adversity, and they can take a hit if you want, and they get back up and they they keep on skating. I think it's some of the people of Marymount, and there's some incredible people, and as you said, uh, I've known Joe Dunford for uh, almost 50 years, and he comes from an incredible family. Um, you know, interesting enough, a story, I, I actually acquired my first business from Joe Dunford. I bought his Patriot Ledger uh, paper route early on in the days, but Joe has always been a person of incredible character, and he took that character from Marymount. I had a chance to serve in combat with him. Uh, in, in Afghanistan and in, in, in Iraq and along the way and uh, there's no finer officer uh, in the United States military than Joe Dunford. As part of the weekend dedication, Quincy's civic-minded corporate neighbors stepped to the plate 
to sponsor a dinner benefiting the Semper Fi and Americus Fund. The Semper Fi and Americus Fund is dedicated to providing assistance to combat wounded and critically ill service members, military family members, and veterans from all branches of the U.S. Armed Forces. But each of their lives has been profoundly impacted by their service. The fund, uh, like for other individuals, has provided a wide range of support to these veterans, from bedside support to adaptive vehicles, specialized wheelchairs to assist with mobility. But in the end, what we're not about is specific types of care. What we want is each of the members that's part of the fund family is to have the very best quality of life they can possibly have in the context of their injuries and to have as much independence as they can possibly have. And that's what your support tonight is going to allow them to do. These humble men who came home, they married their sweethearts, they bought a little cottage on Edgewater Drive in different places in Quincy, and became firemen and policemen, fort over shipyard workers, clam diggers. They made a living and they raised their family. Their sacrifice defending our United States is truly amazing. And General's Bridge is a monument not only to the officers that we we honor today, but to, to their legacy as well. Steve opened up an office on Cottage Ave uh, and then moved his office to Hancock Street uh, right across from his friend Henry Bosworth in the Quincy Sun. So uh, um, he, was a, he was an attorney in the city of Quincy. He loved to litigate, uh, but Houseneck was a, uh, you know, was a special place, was really a special place. Uh, the neighborhood was uh, a great neighborhood filled with kids uh, and uh, so many kids that they had to build a second school in Great Hill to accommodate them. I know he would get a, be very humble and get a big kick out of this. Now Charlie went off to become an Army Air Corps pilot. He ended up towards the end of the war flying a B-29 Superfortress, and had been specially trained for a mission to drop a secret weapon on Japan. You know, he loved Quincy, and, and uh, he grew up on Hamilton Ave. And uh, his dad was uh, had a plumbing and heating uh, business. You know, dad was a, was a great dad, and, and uh, I just, you know, although he was a general when I was born, and everybody always said, what's a, like being, you know, the son of a general. And I just thought everybody's dad was a general. I mean, it was, there was no difference to me. My dad loved his neighborhood. He loved all his friends. And he, he, uh, he said he used to uh, ride his bike all around. And he was the paper boy. You know, I think it was the record American back then. He went to flight training. And at the end of flight training was the day that will live in infamy. Uh, 7 December 1941, which, you know, with the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. And the next day he was commissioned. Uh, so there was a, three planes on, on the mission. So they took off at uh, August 6th, I think 2.45 in the morning. Uh, they all took off separately. They rendezvoused over Iwo Jima. And then they went in for the strike mission on uh, Hiroshima. Uh, the next day, August 7th, uh, Colonel Terrors pulled my father in and he said, uh, the Japanese don't surrender tomorrow by tomorrow. We're gonna drop another bomb and I want you to command the mission. The dropping of that second weapon was what convinced the Emperor of Japan to fold up the war, fold up the tent, and unconditionally surrender. Now, when you get all the blather out of the way and take a look at it, my neighbor, Charlie Sweeney, right down the street in Montclair, is the man who won World War II. Through witnessing my dad over the years and through his peers, I've acquired two incredibly invaluable life lessons. Lesson one, time is precious. When your dad is away, maybe stationed in another state or deployed, you begin to understand that your dad can't be there for all the hockey games, 
He can't play around to golf, and he probably won't be home for your recital. It is a sacrifice, but you have to understand that this sacrifice does not equate to the gravity of the duty each service member is committed to. Lesson two, dad taught me that we always have the stars in common. No matter your location in the world, you always have the stars watching over you. Even though we're oceans away from each other, every night we grasp the feeling of peace to last us through and temporarily alleviate the pain of separation because we know the starry skies are one union. To say being a part of this park and bridge among the group of generals being honored is humbling is truly the understatement of a lifetime. Quincy is a special city. The city provided many opportunities for us as kids and young adults. We learned to deal with conflict at a young age and probably inadvertently learned many lessons in leadership along the way. Adam shows a great neighborhood. The memories I have now are really, it seemed like there was 30 to 35 kids in your age group. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't that many, but there was, there was always something going on. It was either basketball games, street hockey games, you know, tackle football without pads. It was just a, a great neighborhood to grow up in. In the earlier days, uh, the whole neighborhood would go on Adam Shore Beach, on Heron, Heron Road Beach in Adam Shore. And, you know, you know, I guess we thought we were in Antasca or the Cape, but everyone was laid out with the coolers and the, and the things, and every, every family in the neighborhood was there. General McConville's dad was a hockey ref in Quincy Youth, so I think he might have tackled me once or twice and, and threw me in the sin bin um, while we were playing. But I did know his younger brother, uh, Paul. Uh, we used to run around, because Marymount being so close to Adam Shore, we, you know, we, we did still kind of hang with the Marymount kids, and, as well as German Town and Neck as well. Um, I wanted to go to college, and you know, I was looking for ways, creative ways to, to finance it, and looked, saw the garden, you know, they were paying tuition. I wanted to do both. I, I, st I wanted to serve, but I also still wanted to go to college. I didn't want to delay. And my uncle was a police officer in Boston, so I guess uh, he was more some, somewhat of a role model. And I think serving in the guard, I still had that. I think that service mentality, and uh, thought I would I would try it out in law enforcement. And it turned into a you know a 30-year career with the state police, which uh, which actually paralleled the guard well. That's what the military brings is that that commonality and that common bond, and again that that esprit de corps and that morale. So they're all again from different walks of life and you all come in and one of the things the guard is doing lately which i thought was fascinating and they, they they tell you when you're mentoring some of these young folks now you don't ask them where they're from you ask them how they grew up because it's going to provoke a completely different response so if you ask me where i'm from i'm going to say i'm from quincy or i'm from adam show but if you ask me how i grew up i'm going to talk about you know those 30 kids the same age and playing the sports and so you're going to get a completely different uh, different answer from them just by changing that question a little bit I knew really as a young kid uh, that, I, that I wanted to go in the Marine Corps someday. In fact, uh, probably in sixth grade, um, I had a teacher named Mrs. Perry uh, at St. Anne's whose husband was in the FBI. And she, she asked us, and it's probably still in the house somewhere, it's 25 years from now, what are you going to be doing? So you had to write an essay in sixth grade. And I wrote that I was a part-time FBI agent, a part-time Marine. My initial obligation to service was, uh, was two years in those days, a two-year contract. And after I'd been out there about two years, uh, I actually resigned. I said, hey, I'm gonna, it's time to go home. So I went up to my colonel and said I was going to go home. And it's a long story, but I, uh, I, I changed my mind and I stayed. I got orders to Okinawa, Japan for a year uh, in those days and went off to Okinawa still with the intention that when that was over, I'd come home. And even during those days, I, I did take the FBI test, I took the Secret Service test, I applied to law school, I went and did a couple of interviews to be a production manager. So I looked at a lot of other uh, opportunities and, and as I was thinking, thinking my way through this, 24, 25 years old at the time, and then uh, I decided to take a set of orders from Okinawa to Washington, D.C., still with the intention of in that first couple of years getting out, I went to graduate school during that period of time, again, with the intention of going off and doing something else. And then uh, I think probably about year seven or eight, I realized I'd looked at everything else and this is actually what I wanted to do. And these are the people I wanted to be around. All of us of, of this generation, uh, military-wise, we're, we're all fought in Afghanistan. We're all fought in Iraq and, uh, you know, we, we've all, experienced losses uh, of great men and, and women and you know the thing about uh, combat is you find out a, a lot about people and people come together and you see ordinary people do extraordinary things and I've seen that in, in many many cases where young men and women have stepped up 
um, run through withering fire uh, to save uh, their fellow soldiers or their fellow Marines or, or really their fellow servicemen. And um, just very, very honored to have the opportunity to serve with each and every one of them. They do incredible things uh, for this country. The city of Quincy has a great history and it's an honor to be part of reviving this history and uh, not reviving actually, but continuing and celebrating great citizens of uh, Quincy. Start with a concept model just to understand, okay, this, this uh, movement and the figure will represent, will, that's what will be happening in the, uh, in the actual size. Then a work model is created, which is more precise and serves in general as a study of uh, proportions and symmetry needed. And for example, in a large figure, you want to keep symmetry under control and things like that. So it's a study of the larger size, let's say one third or one fourth of the scale of uh, actual size. And then you go work in the actual size. So there is, uh, there is a process called enlargement. Basically, point by point, uh, proportions found in a working model preserved and mechanically with the, with the assistance of this tool called pantograph. It's an incredible gift for the future generations. I admire absolutely what's going on here. We Rands are a Quincy family, and we have been for a long time. And everywhere I lived, every time somebody said, where do you live, you tell them where you live. But if they say, where are you from, the answer is always the same. I'm from Quincy, Massachusetts. What you've done here with this bridge and this park and this celebration of military service, the honor you've bestowed on us while building on Quincy's rich tradition of honoring her veterans, it's remarkable and it's humbling. I grew up in a house where uh, there wasn't a lot of everything, but there was enough of everything. The one thing there was a lot of was love. You know, the parent and inspiration from both my mother and my father. I always said my father was the strength in the family and my mother was the glue that held the family together. Neither one of them got to go to college, but they both really prioritized education. And my whole life, the one drumbeat I would hear from my father, you're all gonna go to college. So I watched those five older than me work, get good grades, get scholarships, go to college the hard way. I said, I'm gonna go the easy way. I'm gonna join the military. I did my first day at the yard as a chipper, Monday, June 19th. Walked home with my dad. He walked to the yard every day. It was uh, about a mile from where we lived in the point. He'd walk there and then he'd walk home. He was flipping through the mail. He said, you got something here from the Air Force Academy. And it was my acceptance notice. One week before I was due there. I was due there on Monday, June 26th. So, because my dad had uh, pulled a few strings to get me the job, I didn't want to just do a one day gig. So I worked my whole first week as chipper at the yard. And then I said sayonara and went off to the Air Force Academy. After my first assignment, which was in California, and my second assignment, which sent me over to Southeast Asia, I started answering the question, how long are you gonna stay in by saying, I'm gonna stay in until I have a bad job or I go to a place I don't like or I have a boss I don't like. And 32 years later, I finally retired because I never had a job I didn't like, I didn't go to a place I didn't want to go to, and I didn't have a boss I didn't want to work for. There's nothing like being in a uniform and serving the United States of America. He grew up in Quincy, 
He spent 13 years of his life here. He went to grade school in Quincy. He went to junior high school in Quincy. You know, a bridge is something special because it allows you to go where you want to go. We experienced that in the Army. We experienced the need for a bridge that took us from the fall of Saigon in 1975 to the Berlin Wall in 1989. General Sullivan was one of the key leaders that led us through that period of time. General Sullivan culminated his brilliant career in 1995 as the 32nd Chief of Staff of the United States Army. The first thing I remember is my mother taking me to the Abigail Adams Corn and telling me she was there with her children when Bunker Hill was burning. Quincy was sort of wide open, and I worked for the city of Quincy two summers. I worked at Grossman's unloading lumber. You know, the freight comes up from down south. I flunked algebra, and I went home with my report card, and uh, I sort of to soften up a little bit, I said, you know, Ma, I think I'll apply down at the shipyard to be an apprentice. <laughs> and she said, uh, say that again. It was one of those things like, you know, she had her head over here. She thought I was going to come up with some. <laughs> and she said, I, I've got something else planned for you. You're going to there for summer school. Cadet life was like, really? You know, make your bed so that the quarter bounces off the, <laughs> you know. I said, wait a minute, there's got to be more to it than this. I did become a real soldier. And uh, I loved it. I was in the Pentagon on 9-11. So he puts it on the screen and the one tower is smoking and while we're watching it, another plane flies into the other tower. General Jumper says, all right, we all know what's going on here. Everybody, meeting's over, go take care of business. Phone rings and it's my wife. I said, hi honey, I'm kind of busy right now. She said, have you seen what's going on in New York? I said, yeah, that's why we're so busy. And at that moment, the plane hit the building, hit our building. Fireball goes up outside my window, the lights flicker and go off, the building shakes, and I say, uh-oh, got to go now, we just got hit, and hung up the phone. We had to evacuate the building, of course, um, and they wanted everyone, it's something like 25,000 people work in that building, 23, something like that. They wanted everyone away from the building in case another plane was coming. They thought there might be a second plane like there was in New York. Uh, and there was another plane in the air at the time, missing and not reporting. And they had already scrambled F-16s out of the guard base across the river at uh, Boeing Air Force Base. And then a, a truck came down the street and they said, we're looking for 50 volunteers to go in and help us carry people out of the Pentagon. So I jumped up and got to be one of those 50 guys to go back in through the smoke and fumes, flames, and try and get people out of there. But it, the heat was too intense. We probably carried eight or 10 people out. So I went all the way back up to my office. I, had a, I found a towel out by the door. I dip, dipped it in a bucket of water, wrapped it around my face, walked back up to my office, picked up the landline on my desk and called Quincy, called my mom. What I remember is the blue sky when we went outside of that building and what a beautiful blue sky there was on that September day, spoiled by this really acrid, dark black, huge billowing clouds of smoke coming out of the Pentagon. Well, you know, it's kind of two phases, uh, I think, of, of leadership. 
you know, the first is kind of the tactical day-to-day -day level, right? And that's, that's the early days, and frankly, the most rewarding and the most enjoyable. That's when it's all about people, and it's about personal relationships, and it's about knowing people. And, and as I tell people, you don't lead units, you lead individual people in those units. And you gotta find out what makes them inspired to do great things and lead them in a way that, that gets the best uh, out of them. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, at that level, you really are, you know, Marines, I, I love Marines and we think we're special, but at the end of the day, they're ordinary men and women. And, uh, and what you've got to do is you've got to pull them together to do extraordinary things. And, uh, and that requires them as a team to do something that's much greater than anything they could do as individuals. And, and I actually think the basics of leadership at that level are pretty simple. I think Marines, number one, they want, they want to be told what to expect. They want to, why are we doing something? What are we going to do and why? Explain to me why this is important. Because then when the plan falls apart, as it always does, they know what it was supposed to be at the end of the plan. Uh, they don't want a checklist. They don't want you to tell them how to do something. They just want you to tell them what needs to be done and they want to be unleashed to, to uh, have their own individual initiative to make things happen. The other thing they want to know is that you actually care about them. And, uh, and you can't fake that. The only way that you can let them know you care is to be personally engaged and actually have a personal relationship. And I can say that, you know, at the, uh, at the early stage, you're actually able to have a personal relationship with every one of your people. Every one of your Marines and sailors that are in Marine units, you have a personal relationship. You know, I look for four qualities uh, in leaders, and uh, I think two are more important than others, but you know, certainly we want leaders that are competent, that know their job, they're masters um, of their profession. Uh, we need leaders that are committed. Uh, they're, they're willing to put the extra work in. They're, they're, they're passionate about what they're, they're doing. And, and those are two things that I think are necessary for leaders, but they're not sufficient. Two other things I think are really important when we talk about leaders is character. We need leaders of character that do the right thing the right way for the re right reasons. Not for personal gain, not for anything else. They do it for the right reasons. And the fourth is, they care, they truly care about the service men and women that they lead. I think the generals honored here today are simply links in a long chain of men and women from Quincy who have sought to make a difference by living a life characterized by service. And if you look at it that way, the bridge and the park are less about recognizing any of us as individuals and more about highlighting the values in the traditions that are most important to Quincy, Massachusetts. We honor these generals for their devotion to our nation in the protection of its constitution, our way of life, and the welfare of the men and women who don the uniform. These men never sought accolades or rank. They were chosen to lead because they possessed the virtues of leadership, integrity, courage, humility, loyalty. 18 generals from Quincy dating back as far as the American Revolution. Whether or not that is a record, it is certainly something to be proud of. Seven of the 18 generals could be considered modern day leaders. Five of the seven are still living and one of the five still actively serving our country. Their unselfish devotion to our country and their willingness to serve and become a part of something greater than themselves is what we truly celebrate. Through these men, we celebrate the city of Quincy's legacy of service to our nation. More than 17,000 men and women answered the call to serve over the past two and a half centuries, some making the ultimate sacrifice to preserve our freedom. Those who did return safely home added so much to the fabric of our community through their character, work ethic, and patriotism. We cannot take their sacrifice for granted. We have an obligation to shape future generations. I can't think of a more genuine example to inspire our young people to be their best than those who we honor directly and indirectly with the General's Bridge and Park. No matter the challenges we face as a nation, stories like these serve as a reminder that we remain the greatest country on earth. May God continue to bless the men and women who serve and protect these United States of America. <laughs> <laughs>